Hi, this is Tim Cool with Smart Church Solutions, and I'm the instructor today for your uh, Council for Facility Stewardship course. This course is called Plan For It, the Four Essential Master Plans for Every Church. This is course number 201, and this is a two-part course. So today we're going to be looking at part one, and then there'll be a second part as well. So let's go ahead and dig into this, uh, give you a little bit of background on this is Several years ago, I wrote a book called Plan For It, uh, the number four. There's a little bit of um, play on words here. Uh, the concept here isn't so much that you have to have four master plans of the property. In fact, um, there should be one master plan, and, and master plans should be reevaluated every three to five years because things change. So this is a little bit of, again, play on words. There's, there's four components to the master planning process. And that's really what we're gonna to cover today. So I love this uh, question is, would you tell me why I ought to go from here? Tell me which way I ought to go from here. That depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. I really don't care where, replied Alice. Then it doesn't much matter which way you go, said the cat. Uh, this is from Alice in Wonderland. And that sounds too often like board meetings, deacon meetings, elder meetings that I've been in over the years, where there's not a clear direction as to where we want to go. And so if we don't know where we're going to go, then we're happy just kind of going anywhere, letting the wind blow as it may. So let's, let's dive into this. What is a master plan? Um, I grew up in the church and... Um, a master plan to me was the pretty picture that was put out in the lobby of how we were going to utilize the building and the land, mainly the land. So too often we see these kind of master plans either on websites or on people's um, announcement boards or maybe in social media on a set of um, tripods in your foyer or, or lobby area. This is a component of a master plan. This might be even what is referred to as an architectural master plan or a land utilization master plan. So in essence, a master plan is a vision of the future beginning with today's realities. It's, it's a look into the future. It's a vision of the future. Where do we think God has us going? How how are we going to accommodate the vision of where he's taking us? And it's of the future. It's not necessarily of just today. And so it's looking at our vision. It's looking down the road, but it's also facing today's realities. Let me put this in perspective. If you are a church of 100 people and you have a, a vision that God wants you to um, develop a 5,000 seat sanctuary for your 100 people. Okay, that's great. You look at the vision, you look at the future, but then you have to face reality. With only 100 people, can we afford it? In fact, could you even afford to have the architectural drawings drawn for a 5,000 seat sanctuary? Most likely not. So we have to look at the realities. We have X number of people. We have X amount of money. We have X amount of uh, income, ties and offerings. Uh, so you take all those realities into perspective as you're looking at your vision and how you're going to get there. Here's another quote that I really like from Abraham Lincoln. If we could first know where we are and whether we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. Again, this goes back to that facing of reality. We first have to address where are we and where are we tending right now? then it'll be much better for us to start looking at how do we move to the future. So to get us started, I'm gonna use a, an analogy of how we, most of us will plan a family vacation. I know when, when our kids were little, uh, I'm gonna go through how we should have planned vacations, not necessarily how we always did, but, but stay with me, this is gonna be kind of fun. So how many of you watched, um, you know, Vacation, the movie with the Griswolds and whatnot? OK, so uh, I'm hoping that that your plan in master planning doesn't become like their trip, uh, but too often it does. Uh, so now with that visual in mind, let's move on to the vacation planning. First, vacation planning 101. Why are we taking a vacation? 
Is it for the kids? Do we just need a break? This is a special occasion. Is it uh, a grandparent's birthday anniversary? Is it a college graduation, uh, high school graduation? Um, why are we taking a vacation in the first place? Have we always taken one? So it must be the, the, the right thing to do, right? So too often, you know, we do things because what well, we've always done it that way. We've always taken a vacation. So it must be the right thing to do, right? Well, then the Joneses took a vacation. So obviously we need to take a vacation to keep up with the Joneses. Then, you know, the church network has a conference. So for those of you who belong to the church network, they have a conference. And so you just assume that you need to go out on a vacation there and take the whole family with you. So those are, those are kind of, you need to ask and answer those why questions. Here's some more questions. When can we go and who is available? When our kids were little, the who can we go was really dependent upon my wife and I. Um, and the who was available, the kids basically went when we, where we took them, when we took them. As the kids got older, and even now with adult kids, when we wanna to try to do something as a family to get away, boy, it's the who is available becomes a really tough thing to, to navigate. Then we have to decide where do we want to go? Are you beach people? Are you mountain people? Um, are, are, are you uh, out of the country, in the country? Where do you want to go? How long will you be gone? Are you gonna be gone a day, a week, a month? You gotta decide these factors. And what is our budget? You know, are we gonna are we gonna sock away and have we saved for the last year a thousand dollars, two thousand, ten thousand? How much are we gonna spend on this family vacation? And then how will we get there? Planes, trains, and automobiles, uh, campers, are we doing something else? What is our means of transportation to get to where we want to go for this vacation? So looking at it further, number seven, where will we stay? Are we going to stay in a Airbnb, a hotel? Uh, if it's a hotel, is it a Ritz Carlton or a Motel 6? Uh, are we going to backpack it and stay in tents? Are we going to RV it? What? Where are we going to stay? What will we eat? And what's the budget for eating? Are we going to eat out every meal? Are we going to cook in every meal? Is there going to be a hybrid of those two? How, how are we going to eat? And what's the budget? Are we planning on beanies and weenies? Um, for all the meals, are we going to go elaborate and have seafood run night and steak another night? These are factors, again, to consider. What activities will we do? And what's the budget of those? If we're going uh, to the coast, are we going to run a boat? Are we going on a fishing expedition? Uh, are we going to rent paddle boats? Uh, if we're in the mountains, are we going hiking? Uh, is there money involved with that? If we're going to a national park, do we need to pay to get in and pay to park? And then what are our contingency plans? What if someone gets sick? What are we going to do? What if the car breaks down? And what if the hotel burns down before we get there? These are things that we should be planning for when we're thinking about planning a vacation. So I'm hoping that you see a little bit of the correlation between planning a family vacation and then also planning a, um, a building, a master plan. So where do we get start, started with all this? We need to face realities. We've got to understand them and face them head on. So first, let's, let's all agree on something. Can we all agree that things change? I think most of you probably don't have hitching posts at your, um, in your parking lot for horse and buggies. Now, if you're in North Dakota or Wyoming, you might still have some. That's not a disparagement to my friends out there. Um, it's just there, there's still uh, people that use those mode of transportation. Um, but let's, let's agree for the most part that things change. So how many of you remember car phones? You need to be my age or so to remember the car phone. It, this is a picture of a car phone very similar to the one I had in 1986 when I bought my first car phone. Um, back then, that car phone cost almost a $1,000. Um, and now if you buy a, you know, an I-12, you're going to spend about that same amount of money. But there was a period of time where you could buy cell phones for pennies. And uh, so to think that you spent $1,000 in 1986 was pretty ridiculous. 
the thing really can only do three things. It can make calls if you had cell service. It could receive calls if you had cell service. And back in 86, most of the cell service was only on the interstates. There wasn't much cell service uh, on the um, back roads and in suburban areas. The other thing that these phones had is they had a really cool mounted antenna on the back of the car. It had this little look like a pigtail kind of thing. And it made, it made you almost look like a police car, which was kind of cool. So car phones uh, were, were a great start, but think about today. And we think about our mobile phones, our smartphones. Think of all the things that we can do with the mobile phone now. Make calls, receive calls, text, GPS, the list goes on and on and on. We can even read our Bible. In fact, almost all of my Bible reading is done from my mobile phone. Um, and so things have changed. You think that the, the iPhone is only 12, 13, 14 years old? Um, and so in, in just a little over a decade, we have gone from the car phone or the bag phone to now what Steve Jobs always wanted, which was a computer in everybody's hand. Welcome to the world of smartphones. So even think about computers, the computer on the left was the IBM PC Junior. It was the first computer we ever had back in 1986. Now you think of what you can do with computers and um, uh, writing tablets and so on. It, it, it's, it's significantly different, again, in a relatively short period of time. How do we do offerings? Back when uh, in 86, there was not an option for online giving. Everything was done in the plate. Uh, and you were really radical if you didn't use the plate and used a box in the back, uh, but it still was a manual operation. Now you think of online giving. We have many clients that are anywhere from 75 to 95% of their total giving is done online. Well, that's different. Things have changed. Even how we do church. Um, you know, there's not that many churches being built today with steeples. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. There's just not that many of them. Few churches are putting pews in. Uh, very few churches are using hymnals anymore. It's a little story. Uh, back when my son Lee was in high school, he went and, and visited a church where his friend was going to preach that night. And he called me up and he goes, Dad, they sang out of books. I mean, my, my son had never been in a church with a hymnal. And, um, and so things change. You know, I grew up with hymnals. Um, and, and until I was probably in my early 30s, we always sang out of hymnals. So things will change. So we're going to look at the four master plans now. We're going to dig into the first two in this course. The second two we'll address in part two. So in thinking through plans, let's start with Proverbs 21.5. The plans of a diligent lead surely to advantage, but everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. So it is important for us to plan properly. So the very first master plan is your ministry master plan. What has God called your church to do? Your church is different than any other church. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But you can't start with what building do we need? You have got to start with what has God called us to do? What's unique about us? And that ministry master plan needs to be well thought through. A thousand policemen directing traffic cannot tell you why you come or where you go. Um, ever ever watch uh, traffic cops or football referees all pointing in different directions? It does us no good if we don't have a deliberate plan for our ministry initiatives. What has God called us to do in our community? So to me, this starts off with understanding who we are. Uh, who are we as a church? So here, here's some things that, that I would ask is, what is your vision for ministry? Who is your target? And target isn't an exclusivity kind of thing. A target is where you spend the majority of your time and energy. What is our DNA as a ministry? What makes us unique from all others? How do we does define value for our ministry? Some people define value as stained glass and pipe organs. Other people define value as uh, how many um, people can we serve at a soup kitchen? Not right or wrong, just different things that um, would define value for you. What is our story? 
how do how do we want to communicate that to our community, both with our building and in our actions and our service? Then think through, if space and finances weren't an issue, what ministries would you start or expand? I'm not saying that you could, but this part is thinking through the whole ministry aspect of things. Then flip that question. And if you don't start or expand these ministries, what kind of impact will that decision have on your community? If you don't do the things that you feel God's leading you to do, will it have a direct impact on your community? Too often we get caught up in what I consider meism, and this is just a funny uh, image: the consumeristic church of the sacred demographics. You know, trying to be all things to all people. It just frankly doesn't work. And meism is basically we do all of this to make me happy. And that's, that's a recipe for disaster, in my opinion, when we're thinking about defining our ministry master plan. It's got to be for the whole and the good of the kingdom that our church has been called to do and not about personal preferences. So if, if you look at your hand, you notice your fingerprints. Your fingerprints are different than everybody else in the world. This is DNA. This is part of the who. This is your uniqueness. God created DNA with us as human beings. The same applies to our church. Every one of our churches has a unique DNA. Now, there may be similarities. Sure, there's similarities. My kids have similarities with me, but they do not have my exact DNA. So let's look at uh, what makes things unique. There, there's several um, factors that, that we look at. The first is your people. The people that, that attend your church, call your church home, make it unique. The next is your place. Are you in a certain part of the country, in a certain state, in a certain city, on a certain corner in that city? Your place will impact your uniqueness. The third is your passion. What are your leaders passionate about? What gets them up in the morning or keeps them awake at night? Where those intersect is the uniqueness of your church. You could have similar people or even people from the same family at two different churches in churches that are on the same city block, but the passion is different, which makes those two churches unique. Um, I assure you that a, a church in Miami does ministry different than a church in Anchorage, Alaska. Their place is going to drive things. People will drive things and their passions are going to drive things. So, we need to get comfortable with the fact that we are unique from any other church in America, in the world for that matter. So then look at the why. Why do we exist? You know, think through what is your mission and vision statement? Is it lived out? Is it reflected in all ministry areas? Or has it become that slogan on the wall or at the bottom of your website that no one can even remember how you came up with it? And if it's not being reflected in all ministry areas, then it may be time to either dispose of it or come up with something else that works better. Because this quote kind of nails it home for me. If the culture of a church is at odds with the stated beliefs of the church, the unstated message speaks louder than the stated one. So if you have a vision mission statement that you've got plastered everywhere that says one thing, but your church acts and performs in a different way, the mission and vision statement will be ignored and the actions will speak louder than the written words. There's a book that I really like, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. This is a, a secular book. Uh, it's a business and leadership book, uh, but I highly recommend it uh, for people to read. And here's a couple of reasons why I think it, it's critical for churches to grasp this. Here's a quote from the book. Very few people or companies can clearly articulate why they do what they do. When I say why, I don't mean to make money. That's a result. By why, I mean, what is your purpose, cause, or belief? Why does your company exist? Why do you get out of bed every morning? And why should anyone care? He goes on later in the book to talk about how most organizations, churches, businesses, nonprofits, schools, they know what they do, and they know how they do it. They just don't know why they do it. 
So there's times I'll ask a church, why does your church exist? And too often I get, because we love people and love God. Well, congratulations, you are a church. If that is the only reason why you exist, then you're just like just about every other church. My deeper question here is why does your church exist? Not why does the church universal exist? And if you can understand and explicitly explain your why, then some of the other questions get closer into focus. Then how? How do we do ministry? And is it how we would prefer to do it? Um, how are you doing children right now? How do you do worship? And again, please, please hear me. None of this has to do anything with style or method or means, but do you really know how you are doing ministry? And is it how you would do it if you had a choice? Winston Churchill has a famous quote, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. Too often, and in most churches in America, our buildings are telling us how to do ministry. Our buildings are telling us that we can only seat so many people. It tells us we have to do children's ministry a certain way. It tells us that we can't congregate because we have a very small foyer or lobby. Our buildings become a deterrent at times because they are now shaping us instead of us shaping the buildings. So th that's a look at the ministry master plan. That helps us get started with knowing that we have got to spend some serious time looking at our ministry master plan, our why, our who, our how. The next master plan is your financial master plan. And this is a critical master plan for everyone to look at. Because frankly, if you don't have your finances in order, then the facility master plan is really not even worth spending any time exploring. So the first thing you need to do is stop and become informed before you take any more steps. Understand your financial condition and your financial situation. There's a continuum that I try to work with churches on of this fact and faith. The faith side says we believe God can do all things, and, and I believe that as well. The fact side is we only have so much money and so many people and so much land, we can only do X. I believe that there is somewhere between those two um, continuum points where judgment steps in, and we have to trust God. And we have to make some um, steps of faith to do what God wants us to do. For, for those that, as I use the example of we want to build a 5,000 seat sanctuary and we have 100 people, that's faithful folly, in my opinion. At the same time, if we, do, if we only say this is all we can afford because this is all the cash we have, or this is um, all that the number of people we have, then you're saying, God, we don't trust you to grow us. We don't trust you to meet our needs. Um, and, and so both ends of the spectrum, I think, um, uh, are limiting, and we need to consider uh, something that's more in the middle, and your leadership needs to use their best judgment as to where that line is from a comfort standpoint. So in looking at your financial evaluation, first off, you need to know what your financial budget is, and this is of your not non-designated funds. Um, if you have designated funds, and I'm frankly just not a fan of designated funds, but if you're a church that has them, then you need to limit that from your equation because you can't use those monies uh, for this evaluation. Then you think through what kind of a capital campaign, what do we think we can raise in that, or what's our source of cash? Do we have cash already? Are we going to liquidate property or stocks that have been given to us? Um, are we going to have 100 car washes between now and the end of the year? Then thirdly, what's your borrowing capacity? And then fourthly, what is your current debt, if any? These four kind of build a, a benchmark and a, a uh, process for which we can do some high, high level evaluations on finances. So here's a overly simplified calculator. And all my friends that are in the capital campaign industry and lenders uh, please don't send me the nasty emails um, because this is this is only th this is about a hundred thousand foot level, not even a fifty thousand foot level of, of what a project could be. 
So I generally will look at two to two and a half times your annual income of non-designated plus cash, which includes what you think you can raise in a capital campaign minus any debt. And that is your maximum project budget. Remember that word project. We're gonna come back to that later um, in, the, uh, in the second part of this uh, series. Um, but that is that gives you a really, really high level idea of what a project budget could be. So here's an example of um, if, if I have annual income of 3.2, 3.2, or maybe it's only 3 million, how much cash do I have on hand? Um, what do I think I can borrow? Uh, what, I mean, what's my current debt? What do I think I can raise in a campaign? Um, what do I feel is a factoring number of what I can actually collect from what's been pledged? Um, and then taking my annual income times a multiplier, I used anywhere from one five to two five. Um, that gives me a maximum loan amount minus debt. Uh, so it gives me a maximum new loan amount plus capital campaign, which gives me a, a maximum net project. So you can see all of those factors play a huge part in what a total project might be. This is important because if this is true, if any of these numbers fit in line with, with what's above, then we need to, to consider that as we're starting to, to draw and plan a, a building, which we'll get into in the, in the next uh, part of this course. So project budget versus building budget. Project costs versus construction costs. This is a huge issue for most churches when they're planning. If a church calls me up and says, hey, Tim, we'd like to do a $1 million project. My first question will be, is that you want to spend a million dollars on the building or a million dollars on the project total? When they tell me it's a million dollar project, then I let them know right away that you're only looking at 600, maybe even $500,000 of building because of all the other costs that are associated with it. This is where too often churches get in trouble when they, when they head down a path, particularly with an architect or a design build firm. And they tell them our budget's $5 million and they design a $5 million building and they forget all of the other things that are included in it. That when, it, when they start looking at their financing, they realize, ooh, the building may be 5 million, but we need $7 million in order to pay for all the other costs. You know, so think of, think of what these other budget line items are. You've got civil engineering and surveying and geotechnical costs, architectural engineering fees, uh, project manager or an owner's rep cost, permit costs, property insurance and builder's risk insurance, legal assistance. You're most likely going to want to have some kind of council reviewing contracts. You may have specialty engineering like a landscape architect or kitchen design, audio, video, lighting and acoustic design. Uh, there's going to be costs with that. Interior design, thematic design and implementation. So think of things like wayfinding and kids theming and so on. You're gonna have furniture, fixture and equipment. And then you'll actually have the cost of your audiovisual lighting and acoustical system, not just the design of it. You're gonna have technological uh, implementations and IT design. Uh, and this is becoming a bigger and bigger issue when you think of the, um, the fact that we are um, requiring Wi-Fi and internet in so many of the things that we do. You're likely to have capital stewardship campaign costs. Uh, you might have demolition and renovation costs that is, you know, in addition to what your new construction costs may be. And don't forget inflationary contingency. Um, if you start planning a building today, uh, rule of thumb is that you'll move into it in about um, a thousand days. So almost three years. Well, as we've all seen in, during the pandemic and now coming out of the pandemic, construction costs went up enormously. Well, if you had planned on a $5 million building in 2019, you might be looking at a six, six and a half million dollar building in 2022. You're gonna have design and construction contingency, uh, financing costs, loan fees, closing costs, so on. Uh, you might have permit expediting services, particularly if you're in an area like Los Angeles or Miami, New York City. Uh, site work, grading, utilities, paving, and landscaping. Oh, and yes, you've got the building then as well. So you can see the building plays 
a it's it's a big part, but it's not the only part, and we can't forget all the other costs going into a um, a, a building program and a master planning exercise when we're considering our financial master plan. Here, here's just an example, and this has a little bit of date, a little bit of age on it. So just so we're aware, in 2022, $150 a square foot is too low unless you're building a warehouse. But you can see the, the ratio still work here. A $2.5 million budget for the project. By the time I take all of these other costs and then take my dollar per square foot, I'm only looking at a 7,000 square foot building for two and a half million dollars. Uh, today, that might be more of a 5,000 square foot building. So when, when, we, when we look at this, we have to understand that our finances are critical. We have to understand them. We have to evaluate them. So going back to the first two master plans, one, you have got to have a ministry master plan. Who has God called you to be? And secondly, what has uh, our finances, how do they look? How are they going to support the ongoing ministry? And how might they support a building as well? So that's the end of uh, this first part. Um, again, on the behalf of the Council for Facility Stewardship, I want to thank you for, for uh, attending this course. And um, please let us know how we can help you further. And I strongly recommend that you um, watch part two. And uh, we will see you next time. Have a great day.